Spider-Man Far From Home is kinda... weird. It's kinda hard to articulate into words. Much like everyone else under the sun these days, I am of course a massive Marvel fan and have been following all of the Marvel Cinematic Universe movies for years now, and one of my all-time favourite characters is Tom Holland's rendition of Spider-Man. Since his appearance in Captain America Civil War, I have always found him to be undeniably the most entertaining and fun character. And I particularly liked the awkward youthful spin they put on this version of Spider-Man to give him a real coming of age story arc to follow alongside the massive universe. His connections and adoration to Tony Stark was heartwarming to see and an interesting logical next step for both of the characters and worked fantastically well on screen too. And Spider-Man Homecoming capitalised on the relationship further with Spider-Man trying to become more of the hero he wants to be for the neighbourhood, while Stark is trying to assist him in not screwing the whole thing up, finalising Spider-Man into becoming an Avenger and having his identity compromised to Aunt May. And now with Endgame passing over and Tony Stark gone from this universe, I was super excited to see the next progression of Tom Holland's Spider-Man. Dealing with loss so directly while having it shoved in your face from all directions and being poked into filling such gigantic shoes? It sounds like a lot of really enticing storytelling. So now here we are with Spider-Man Far From Home. To give a non-spoilery overview, which I swear will be more brief this time, Peter Parker and the school class are going on holiday to different countries in Europe. And while Peter Parker wants a break from hero stuff just to relax with his friends, all hell is breaking loose with elemental creatures popping up from the earth. Not to mention Nick Fury wants a word with Peter, and you don't ghost Nick Fury. This holiday for Peter's gonna be one to remember whether he likes it or not. Now after watching the film, I can firmly say that I enjoyed it, and everyone I've spoken to certainly puts it in quite high regards too. It's another Tom Holland Spider-Man movie. It's funny, it's charming, it's awkward, and it's satisfying. It's still some of the best Spider-Man stuff we've ever seen. But you see, to me, Spider-Man Far From Home is kinda... awkward. Or at least, that's how I felt throughout the entire time I watched it the first time around. Now well, maybe that was because I was crammed in a small seat surrounded by strangers rather than friends when I watched it the first time, but also I felt a lot of secondhand embarrassment and awkwardness throughout the whole film. In one of the first scenes, we see Aunt May doing a public speech alongside Spider-Man in his suit, and he's so awkward and so stiff that I, I couldn't just not cringe for him. He's in Spider-Man form. This is his chance to not look like a weirdo in spandex. And I never realised just how strange he looks compared to normal people until he was leaving the stage looking like a reflection. Collective I saw. God, he could have just dangled from the ceiling or something to be a little bit more Spider-Man-y or something. I also briefly thought that he walked onto the stage without his mask at the end of that scene because I didn't realise there was a backstage section as well so my heart just like dropped immediately at that point. But anyway, the awkwardness of Peter Parker throughout the rest of this film just continues more and feels like it's rammed up to 10 this time. In the context of talking to MJ, it makes sense since it's a couple of teenagers being awkward around each other. It's normal. But even just whenever he talks to his class, he's always making a scene feel way too intense just by how much he's coiling up on the inside trying to keep people from watching him as he leaps out of a coach for two seconds or something. Obviously, it's kind of in line with his character and it makes for comedy that some people enjoy, but I just found myself awkwardly feeling embarrassed for the guy the whole time. And I guess that's kind of the point considering he is an awkward teen, though this film is definitely pushing this trope up a few notches and against its boundaries. Plus that scene in Austria where he's told to take off his clothes, it's pretty awkward. Kinda funny, but it's a recurring mainstream gag to make sexual assault jokes at males and I don't know how I feel about that honestly. Similarly, there's that scene of Peter Parker undressing and MJ is trying to sneak a peek. In the context of hormonal teenagers, yeah, I get it a little bit more. It's slightly more innocent and is shut down by Ned, but switch those genders around and Marvel would be in a heap of trouble probably. You know what I mean? It's just kind of weird. Now this isn't going to segue well, but I chucked this point midway through anyway, so it was never really going to work with the rest of my points, but Spider-Man Far From Home is kind of... fun. I found that when watching it the second time, I enjoyed it much more. Maybe it's because that time I was with friends, making the jokes seem funnier. But it's true, the film plays with some fun concepts. How does an amateur school news site commemorate those that were lost in Endgame? How can every step of Peter's romantic plan go wrong? And how does an awkward science teacher or two handle themselves in the middle of several European countries? 
And what ways can repetitive superhero tropes like a serious discussion in a bedroom about monsters be subverted? The movie is fun. The recurring theme of Peter trying to sneak away from his class whilst they keep getting redirected by Nick Fury is great to see unfold. And Peter's friend Ned constantly lying to cover Spider-Man only for it to always come crashing down somehow is hilarious a lot of the time. And once you get into the mindset of just running with it and seeing where it goes, you end up having a much nicer time with the movie. And it seems that's what everyone around me seemed to do. And the second time around, I did the same. Because if you don't, the movie might irk you the wrong way slightly. But at the same time, it's not all big scale and spectacle. Because sprinkled across the film, Spider-Man Far From Home is kinda cute. While it still is a superhero movie with a kinda coming of age theme of who Peter Parker is gonna grow and become, there is also a smaller, more personal goal with the blooming relationship of the characters. Right at the start, we know that Peter likes MJ and wants to tell her his feelings at the top of the Eiffel Tower, yet no matter what he does, something always gets in the way and Brad is always there to fill the gap. Yeah, screw you, Brad. And at every opportunity they get to talk, the two of them are both so awkward and nervous as one would expect, but it's clear that their feelings are mutual, and they both just can't articulate it that well. And then there's Ned's relationship, which I wouldn't exactly call cute, but it's something of a recurring theme or gag. And then there's the other side of Peter's life, with him trying to come to terms with getting over Tony Stark despite everything reminding him of the man, or how he tries to find solace in Mr. Beck in wrapping his head around what he wants in life. It's genuinely nice to see the more interpersonal relationships of each of the characters as they grow up as people, despite the whole world ending thing going on in the background or whatever. I think it's my favourite part of these films. I mean, the spectacles are great and all, but I like seeing these heroes as people, with genuine lives, emotions and motivations to bounce off of each other with. If you haven't already, consider subscribing, or if you're a long time viewer, follow my freshly made Instagram account and see my off-screen antics. Now at this point, I'm gonna have to warn you of spoilers from here on out. I've kept things fairly vague up to this point, but we're gonna start moving into specifics now, so you've been warned. Because while I did overall enjoy the experience of the film, even after the second viewing, I couldn't deny the fact that Spider-Man Far From Home is kinda... silly. I mean, all Marvel films are silly to a certain extent, and it's even more so for Spider-Man, but in this film it is particularly the case. The movie seems to be far more comical than usual, and not in the funny sense either. Everything is literally more exaggerated than the Marvel films before it. As the first film in the franchise to be officially part of the next phase of everyone's lives, I have to wonder if this is the odd one out, or if this will reoccur more. I already mentioned it briefly before, but that scene on the coach when Brad is about to be terminated, Peter finds the solution not by talking more to Edith, or by moving Brad out of sight or something, no. He stands at the front of the bus, webs at the steering wheel, in the ruckus he tells everyone to look to the side for mountain goats, which somehow everyone does, and they don't look behind the coach where logically the goats would be by the time they look to the side, just so that he can leap out of the roof, web at the drone, explode it which no one hears or responds to, and then lands again for everyone to miss it. The first time I watched that, I wasn't really impressed by it. It was more of an eye roll situation to me. Sometimes that kind of comic approach works. Peter donking his head on the bell tower twice in a row? Great, tad much, but I could get over that one. This. Not so much. Or how's about that time where literally a satellite sized amount of killer drones pretty much attacked Spider-Man all at once and he just kind of brushed it all off. Sure it was a fun sequence of Webley what is going on, but for such high odds against Spider-Man he sure breezed through that whole segment like it was nothing. And the drones all exploded like a bunch of pop balloons. The weight of the scenario was entirely lost in mere spectacle, making it silly and fun, but less enjoyable beyond what the eyes were seeing. And I think that's a running theme of how I first thought, because Spider-Man Far From Home is kinda... everywhere. Literally, there's about 9 or 10 different locations the movie sporadically runs through. The inciting incident starts in Mexico, the film starts at school in New York, they first go to Venice, attempt Paris but are redirected to Prague, on the way we have to know that they're in Austria for some reason, to reach Nick Fury they must meet in person in Berlin to check off some quota I guess, and when he's hit by a freaking bullet train it leads him to the Netherlands instead of just another stop in Berlin for a joke on foreign names and being in jail? And then the finale clashes in London, but not before we learn Peter is flying over the Dorset coast to get there, and once it's over we come to the New Jersey airport, which sure is I guess close enough to New York, but you get the idea. 
there's a lot of misdirection for one film. One of my favourite Marvel films is Captain America Civil War, and that one also includes a lot of country hopping, but I feel the larger cast somewhat allows for more global exploration to be had. And sure, the concept of this film is a European vacation, but there's still just a little bit too much for just one hero to me. America, Venice, Paris, Prague and London are all good to me, but why Berlin? Why the Netherlands? Why Dorset and Austria too? It was almost becoming hard to follow and a real trial to remember the point of each one in memory. And beyond all the location changes, after the first time watching, I found Spider-Man Far From Home to be kinda... confusing. Like, a lot. Many of my questions were answered the second time around from me just missing details the first time, but even still, this film has a recurring issue of not telling the audience enough and expecting a leap of faith in logic from viewers. Maybe that's the point, people will believe anything these days, so how exactly Mysterio's performance works is kind of up to your imagination. He has killer drones from his hairless glasses wearing goon, who I forgot the name of, and adverse illusion technology that Stark renamed Bath. They create the illusion of some big monster, meanwhile the drones shoot the weapons to cause real destruction. In the theatre scene, where we see the behind the scenes of it all, they're just shooting bullets into the pillars to break them, and in action we see them shoot air blast, missiles and use cutting lasers against a vault door. But then, how did they create the fire elemental? Are there flamethrowers equipped as well? Do they have heat to melt the metal? Is all the destruction part of the illusion too? And how logically do the drones pick up a bus on the London Bridge, crumple it a tad and make it explode? Like what are the drones realistically doing here? And how about Quentin Beck in action? We later learn that the flying Mysterio is part of the CGI illusion animation bit, so when Peter or normal people interact with him mid-battle, how does he turn around and react? Surely that's not part of the planned animation. But then we do see in the theatrical scene that he can command the CGI Mysterio to warp into his physical body and copy it. Can he manually command the CGI Mysterio too? It would answer the question, but we never see that being done in the film. Plus, like, if he can control where the CGI Mysterio is, how can he hear what that CGI Mysterio is supposed to hear? Like, how can he hear Spider-Man shouting at him from the roof if he's not actually at that roof to turn around and say, hey, protect the people from the waterways or whatever? The logic hole is gaping there, and you just have to assume yes. Unless I'm actually wrong about this point, which I would love someone to explain to me if that is the case. Or like, when Peter is sitting sad on top of a building and Mysterio flies up to him and sits down and talks, is he actually there? Is that CGI'd animation? Or is it something in between? How does he achieve his flying theatrics? Because he's just a guy, he can't actually fly or shoot lasers. I just needed a little more show and tell to get my head around what's happening, because there's a suspension of belief that I can't quite agree with after seeing the film twice. That being said, there's some pretty good fan service throughout. Spider-Man Far From Home is kinda referential. All the talk of the multiverse is logically lined up with how the comics work and is a great surprising meta piece as people will believe anything at the start of a new Marvel phase, yet turns out to all be a lie from Quentin Beck. Though it is still a logical option for future Marvel films as being a reverse double plot twist of actually existing or not. There's also the appearance of the literal Spider-Verse in the hallucination sequence with Spider-Man falling through it all. Not to mention the adorable moment of Happy witnessing Peter acting just like Tony Stark when customising his own spider suit. And then there's more to it than that, as Spider-Man Far From Home is kinda foreshadowy as well, as most good films are. The first appearance of the water elemental that we see in Venice is rows of water movement in the rivers, but it's not actually the elemental moving, it's the group of drones swimming into position. Or how Peter is the only one logically to try to piece together the idea of the multiverse while everyone else just blindly accepts it, implying no one else would know if it was a lie other than Peter. There's also actually a couple references to Peter's identity getting out, with him saying if the world finds out, he's done. Or when confronting Happy and Aunt May, he says it's time for the truth to come out, or something to that effect though maybe that one's more of a stretch. We'll talk more about that ending in a little bit. And actually, as bad as it might sound, the ending was probably my favourite part. Not because it ended, but because I felt Spider-Man Far From Home is kinda... underwhelming. Compared to what we've seen prior with Spider-Man, this time around he felt a little bit watered down. 
Now, maybe that makes sense since he is still mourning and he just wants a break to relax and enjoy his holiday. But one of my favorite things about this version of Spider-Man, similar to his comic counterpart, is his snarky dialogue, especially during battles. He's like a mini Deadpool when he fights. Like, remember how much he was constantly talking and gushing about everyone during the airport fight in Civil War? Or how he makes fun of the criminals wearing Avengers masks in Homecoming? In this film, it's almost obsolete. This time around, Spider-Man is put up against non-speaking elemental monsters who certainly aren't primed for conversation, and after that he's against hundreds of mindless drones, not really leaving room for one-liners. Even when lined up against Beck, an actual human being, the action sequence is boiled down to an acid trip of Peter constantly jolting, gasping, and trying to escape wordlessly because fear is taking over him. From what I can remember, there is literally one line of Spider-Man being his Spider-Man self, and that's when he uses a single drone to lift himself higher up to Beck's position, and in it, he just says, going up. And honestly, it feels out of place. Not because of the timing or scenario or anything like that, but just because it's the only one. Why say something there, but never again? It would almost be better if he never said anything, because doing it just once is just inconsistent and weird. The only other part of him saying, come on, at the bell tower, I think, and that's about it. Maybe we could have had something when the fire elemental burns his webs down towards him in Prague. There was no reaction there. Or how's about in London when Spider-Man flew through an explosion, caught fire on his suit for a solid 10 seconds at least, never spoke a word, and then just quietly extinguished himself with a light splash against the River Thames. There was much less opportunities for snarky lines considering the opposition he faced, but there was room for more. And it's like the best part of this Spider-Man. He's awkward, he's talkative, he's funny. And when he's serious and silent and detonating drones like they are just balloons, it's underwhelming and less fun. I did like though how when facing Beck he had his webs disabled, making the stakes a little higher and more real and personal. Very Jackie Chan. But then also let's talk about that final confrontation. The solution continued to feel a little underdeveloped, sort of. Peter wins by using his Spidey set, um, Peter Tinkle. And it was kind of foreshadowed and built up through the movie, but I feel like it needed a little more. You kind of got your root of three moment of establishing it exists with Aunt May at home, reinforcing it by talking to Happy on the jet and executing it on Beck, but the reinforcing scene with Happy was just Peter saying he's gonna use it later, which felt a little undone to me. Plus he just said his sense was not so good or needed work. We see it with the thrown banana at the beginning, and I guess Peter being fooled by Beck's illusion kinda comes into that, but I still feel we needed a little bit more to really drive in that he's got something wrong with him which he can finally overpower in the finale. Because without just that little extra bit, that final swing about of Spider-Man wrecking the drones with his correct sight seems less like Spidey sense logic and more like literal blind luck, and another scene to roll your eyes at because of course it would all work out. An unfortunate blend of silly theatrics and underwhelming solutions, all while Beck as a villain deforms into an over-the-top caricature of himself. Seeming like a man who outsmarts a room, divulging into threatening his crew to tick a box of being evil I guess, to allowing many casualties, which honestly makes sense to me, to screaming illogically at his people to shut off the safety of the danger zone and getting shot by his own drones. If he stayed as a smart and cunning adversary, I feel it'd be more of an enticing villain, being both a visually and emotionally manipulating opponent. But having him become an insane mess at the end turns the film into a kind of generic splurge of what we've seen many times before. At least give the logic of maybe Edith is the thing making him become insane for some reason, like a defense mechanism for realizing he's not the correct owner after all or something. Something to fill that sort of logic gap again, please. But as a final thought, Spider-Man Far From Home is kinda... excitable. For the next part, the ending from the post credit scene was by far my favourite bit. Not only do we finally get this version's appearance of one of my favourite Spider-Man characters with J. Jonah Jameson, but he's also played once again by the irreplaceable J.K. Simmons. What a beautiful love letter to Spider-Man fans, and I sure hope we get to see more of his character in the future. Not to mention the twist cliffhanger. In his final moments, Mysterio releases a video framing Spider-Man for the deaths of the London attacks, as well as revealing his true identity as Peter Parker, blowing his cover across the world and opening up for so much more opportunities for the character in the future. How does Flash Thompson react? What does Spider-Man do next? And just look at how it mirrors not only the ending of Homecoming with Aunt May's reveal, but also the identity reveal of Iron Man being Tony Stark. 
Whether he likes it or not, it seems it is going his way to be the next Iron Man. After all, that question never really got answered at the end of the day anyway. Oh yeah, and also Nick Fury was an illusion too. It doesn't affect the plot much, other than him not actually having the authority to call the real Avengers, which you would have thought they would have been told some other way against an Avengers level threat like, you know, the giant elemental in London, but hey ho, just run with it, remember? Overall, despite all of my negative points, I did enjoy this film. It is a lot of fun, and being around friends definitely made it more enjoyable, but it has a lot of odd flaws, and I kind of hope that this doesn't become the staple for all Marvel films of this new phase. But by no means was this film bad. And hey, maybe some deleted scenes were the glue we needed all along. I still want to see if there's a proper version of the extra trailer scenes, like the robbery with the police, the shopkeeper and the passport quest. All of that was faked for the trailer, but maybe there's some real deleted scenes for them as well. For now though, I'm going to end it off here. Do check out all of my links and stuff like that, as well as my new Instagram account, and let me know your thoughts on this format or other movie topics I should cover. Next Monday, we'll cover Stranger Things 3, and Friday, something games related. But for now, my name's been Daz, you didn't really care, and I'll see you in a bit.